In 2021, many of us take comfort in the fact that forensic science has become so advanced that law enforcement are solving more cases than ever. It's been three years since the Golden State Killer was finally brought to justice, after decades of going free and unidentified. But even with all the leaps and bounds that have been taken in both science and police investigation techniques, there are still thousands of unidentified criminals at large. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two terrifying cases of violent criminals who were never caught. But first, I'd like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's episode. If you're a fan of Cold Case Detective, you've probably got a knack for late night investigations in all corners of the internet. Whether it's deep dives into true crime, or binging the newest mystery thriller series on your favorite streaming service, we all spend a good amount of time online. But there is a safer way, in addition to an opportunity to access the web from any location in the world with Surfshark VPN. One of Surfshark's greatest keys is its ability to unlock access to servers from anywhere on Earth, be it the United States, the United Kingdom, or even East Asia. Surf the web from any country in any time zone. This means your favorite television shows and digital programming that's only available in certain territories are now watchable on your own streaming service accounts like Netflix or Amazon Prime, never leaving you short on options. There's also an additional level of security as well. If protecting your data and information is a priority, Surfshark VPN uses industry-leading encryption to secure your data, keeping your browser history confidential and automatically blocking over 1 million known virus hosting websites and other phishing threats. For a limited time, use our code COLDCASE upon checkout for 83% off and an extra 4 months completely for free, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Easily the best price on the VPN market. So grab your magnifying glass, shut those Venetian blinds, and become a better sleuth with Surfshark VPN. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. The Batman Rapist The Batman Rapist is certainly an odd moniker, and initially, it sounds like it could be a joke. But this serial sex offender should not be underestimated. An opportunist who has struck mostly in the city of Bath, England, the Batman Rapist has attacked at least 17 women. Although it's entirely possible he has more victims the police do not yet know about. The serial attacker is the subject of Britain's longest-running serial rape investigation and has eluded capture since 1991. The investigation into his crimes has been codenamed Operation Eagle and was led by Detective Inspector Paul James up until his retirement from the Avon and Somerset Police Force in 2012. When speaking to the media about the case, James described it as one of the most complicated and protracted investigations that the force has ever undertaken. Authorities believe that the offender first struck on May 21st of 1991, when he attacked a 36-year-old woman as she tried to park her car on Coronation Avenue in Bath. One of his final attacks was eight years later, on January 26th of 1999, when he attempted to assault a 39-year-old woman on Forrester Lane. However, he was scared off by the woman screaming for help. As he ran, he dropped a faded grey baseball cap with a green Batman Forever logo on the front. This is how he got his name. Shortly after this failed ambush, the man abducted another young woman on a nearby street. His last known attack was in May of 2000, when he attempted to carjack a 26-year-old woman whose seven-year-old daughter was asleep in the back seat. Thankfully, he was unsuccessful. From what law enforcement knows so far, all but one of the offender's attacks have taken place in Bath. 
The one anomaly was an assault in Kingswood, near Bristol, where he abducted and sexually assaulted a 19-year-old woman in September of 1996. Although unidentified, the Avon and Somerset Police Force have managed to put together a fairly thorough profile of the serial attacker. Authorities believe that the offender has a detailed geographical knowledge of Bath and operates in a specific hunting ground. His attacks often take place during the winter months, when it's dark most of the day, between 6 and 8 p.m., but also sometimes between 1 and 3 in the morning. He targets lone women who've just returned to their car or are idling in their vehicle. From here, he abducts the women at knife point and using their own car, drives them to a secluded area in the south of the city before sexually assaulting them. He is also known to use a pink, elasticated hairband as a blindfold and additionally has a fetish for tights to the point that if his victim is not wearing any, he will make them put on a fresh pair he has brought to the scene. He will remove his victim's underwear, but have them put their tights back on or put on the pair he has supplied so he can rip them during the assault. Afterwards, the offender drives the women back to the area they were taken from before fleeing. Unlike many other serial offenders, the Batman rapist does not target any particular age group, nor does he exclusively assault women with a certain look. He has attacked girls as young as 16, Law enforcement have added that they believe the perpetrator is in unskilled or semi-skilled employment, may have connections with Oldfield Park in 1991, may live towards the south of Bath or Claverton, and sometimes carries a condom. He is known to always be dressed in black and wearing a baseball cap, and the mother who he attempted to carjack in 2000 described him as being clean-shaven, with a scar beneath his bottom lip and distinctive blue eyes. Police suspect that he may have previous convictions for car crimes because of the ease with which he breaks into vehicles. The perpetrator of these crimes is also known for his long periods of inactivity. Between October of 1991 and November of 1994, he appears to not have committed any crimes. He was also inactive after November of 1994 until June of 1996. Investigators have theorized that there have been other attacks during this lull in activity but that they went unreported or have not yet been linked to the offender. However, one spokesman for the police also suggested that it may be that he comes to the area infrequently, perhaps for work, or that he does not commit crimes while he is in relationships. It has also been postulated that the culprit was in and out of prison or was away from the area while serving in the armed forces. In October of 2000, Avon and Somerset Constabulary delivered leaflets to 25,000 homes in Bath, making it the biggest leaflet drop in the history of British criminal investigations. The leaflet asked female residents to complete a checklist about friends, acquaintances, colleagues, neighbors, or relatives who might fit the following profile. White male, slim or medium build, between the ages of 30 and 50, knows Bath well, has a connection to Bristol, in particular Kingswood, is able to drive, has a tights fetish where he might ask sexual partners to wear tights and enjoys ripping tights, sometimes wears baseball caps, and has aroused suspicions with absences from his home during the evening and early hours of the morning. Although this does not appear to have turned up any successful leads, around the same time, BBC's Crime Watch program also featured a segment on the case, where law enforcement appealed to the public for information. After the show aired, authorities received calls from six women who were victims of the Batman rapist and who had not previously come forward. Investigators also received the names of several potential suspects, including a British diplomat's son. Neither the diplomat's name nor the name of his son have ever been made public, but the dates of the offender's inactivity coincide with the dates the son was out of the country with his father. Although detectives visited the country his father was at to find out if similar attacks had occurred while he and his son were there, there has been no confirmation as to whether this was or was not the case. In fact, there have been no articles about the diplomat or his son in regards to the Batman rapist case. In January of 2001, the Forensic Science Services in the UK used the LCN or low copy number DNA profiling technique to isolate the offender's DNA fingerprints. For comparison, they began taking swabs from around 2,000 men whose names had come up in the investigation. 
However, this does not appear to have propelled the case any further forward. Authorities investigating the abduction and murder of 25-year-old Melanie Hall in June of 1996 have not ruled out a connection between the murder and the Batman rapist's involvement. Melanie went missing after a night out in Bath, and the Batman rapist was known to have tried to carjack a woman at knife point in the same area of the city just hours before Melanie was taken. As of August 2021, there are still no new updates in the case. Although authorities have confirmed that it is still live and is being investigated, the culprit is yet to be brought to justice. Investigators believe there are more victims of his who have not come forward, and find it odd that he has been inactive for two decades. They have not ruled out the possibility that he is now deceased. If you have any information about the Batman rapist, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 triple one. The Connecticut River Valley Killer It was the mid-1980s when three young women disappeared from the town of Claremont in New Hampshire in the USA. In 1985 and 1986, two sets of skeletal remains were discovered 1,000 feet from each other in the village of Kellyville. Although the poor condition of the bodies made it difficult for experts to decipher their cause of death, it was eventually established that these poor young women had succumbed to knife wounds. Sometime between the finding of these two bodies, the third was found. This victim too died from a knife attack. As a result of these discoveries, investigators began to wonder if there was a serial killer operating in the area. They began looking into prior homicides in New Hampshire and slowly began to put the pieces together there was a serial killer walking free. In October 24th of 1978, Kathy Milliken, a 27-year-old who worked for a publishing company, was out photographing birds at the Chandler Book Wetlands Preserve in New London, New Hampshire. However, she never returned home that evening. The following day, her body was found just yards from where she was last seen. It bore 29 knife wounds. Several years later, on July 25, 1981, 37-year-old Mary Elizabeth Critchley, a student at the University of Vermont, vanished near Interstate 91 at the Massachusetts-Vermont border. A few weeks later, on August 9th, her body was discovered in a wooded area along Unity Stage Road in Unity, New Hampshire. Due to the state of decomposition, the medical examiner was unable to determine the young woman's cause of death. Then, on May 30th, 1984, 17-year-old nurse's aide Bernice Quartermanch headed out with the intention of hitchhiking to see her boyfriend in Newport. She was last seen by her boyfriend's mother in Claremont and planned to hitchhike along New Hampshire Route 12. However, Bernice never reached her boyfriend's workplace and was subsequently reported missing. Two years later, in April of 1986, her remains were found by a fisherman. Forensic examination of Bernice's body found that she had sustained an injury to the head and multiple knife wounds to the neck. On July 20th, less than two months after Bernice's disappearance, 27-year-old Ellen Fried, a supervisory nurse at Valley Regional Hospital in Claremont, made a late-night stop to use a payphone in the area. She spoke with her sister for one hour before commenting that there was a car driving back and forth in the vicinity, something which she found odd. Ellen then stepped away from the phone for a moment to make sure that her engine would start before returning. She chatted with her sister for a few more minutes before they hung up. The following day, Ellen failed to report for work, and her car was found abandoned on Jarvis Hill Road, a few miles from where she'd used the payphone. A year later, in September of 1985, her remains were found in a wooded area near the banks of the Sugar River in Kellyville. A post-mortem examination showed that she had been stabbed multiple times and sexually assaulted. On July 10th, 1985, 27-year-old single mother Eva Morse was seen hitchhiking near the border of Claremont and Charlestown in New Hampshire on Route 12. This was the last sighting of the young woman alive. In 1986, her remains were found by loggers about 500 feet from where Mary Elizabeth Critchley's remains were uncovered in 1981. There was evidence that she had been stabbed in the neck. And still, the cases continued. 
On April 15th, 1986, 36-year-old Linda Moore was doing yard work outside her home in Saxton's River, Vermont. She reportedly lived in sight of Interstate 91. In the evening, her husband returned home to find her dead due to multiple stab wounds, and the home was in disarray, showing that a struggle had taken place. Linda's attack was linked to the Connecticut River Valley killings due to the timing and the violent nature of the attack, which involved a knife. Despite the fact that this murder is quite different to the others, as the 36-year-old was attacked inside her home and her body was not dumped in the woodland afterwards. Witnesses reported seeing a slightly stocky, dark-haired man with a blue knapsack loitering near the home that day. He was described as being between the ages of 20 and 25, with a somewhat round face and dark-rimmed glasses. He was also clean-shaven. A year after Linda's demise, a composite sketch of the man was made and released, although he has never been identified. On January 10th, 1987, 38-year-old nurse Barbara Agnew was returning home from a skiing outing with friends in Stratton, Vermont, when she disappeared. Later that evening, a snowplow driver found her green BMW at a northbound I-91 rest stop in Hartford, Vermont. The door was ajar, and there was blood on the vehicle's steering wheel. Just a few months later, in March of 1987, Barbara's body was located near an apple tree in Hartland. She had been stabbed to death. Investigators noted that there had been a heavy snowstorm on the night of the 38-year-old's disappearance, but that she was only 10 miles from home, leaving them uncertain as to why she'd have pulled over. However, online sleuths have proposed the idea that she thought it was better to wait until the storm had calmed before trying to drive home in it. Then, for about 18 months, it appeared as if the Connecticut River Valley Killer had finally stopped. Then on August 6th of 1988, 22-year-old Jane Borowski, who was seven months pregnant, stopped at a closed convenience store in West Swansea on her way home from a county fair in Keene, New Hampshire. Outside the store was a vending machine, where Jane purchased a drink before returning to her vehicle. Inside the car, she noticed a Jeep parked next to her. In her rearview mirror, she saw the driver of the Jeep walk around the back of her car. He stopped at her window and asked if the payphone outside the store worked before grabbing Jane and pulling her from the car. As the 22-year-old struggled, the man accused her of beating up his girlfriend and asked if she had Massachusetts license plates. When she told them that she didn't, she had New Hampshire plates, however, the man did not appear to care and instead produced a knife which he used to stab Jane 27 times before he left her to die. After the horrific attack, the mother-to-be climbed up into her car and began driving to a nearby friend's house following New Hampshire Route 52. As she neared the building, she realized with alarm that her attacker's Jeep was right in front of her. As Jane reached her friend's house, the occupants came to her aid. The Jeep did a U-turn and slowly passed the house before speeding off. Afterwards, Jane was treated at hospital, where the extent of the damage done to her body was revealed. She had suffered from a severed jugular vein, two collapsed lungs, one kidney laceration and severed tendons in her knees and one of her thumbs. Miraculously, both Jane and her baby survived the attack. Jane was able to work with the police to create a composite sketch of her attacker, and she was also able to provide them with the first three characters of the Jeep's license plate. Although authorities were able to narrow the options down to 350 vehicles, they were never able to locate the exact car or the driver who attacks Jane. The 22-year-old also recalled that the perpetrator grew bored when she stopped struggling. After this assault, the Connecticut River Valley killings stopped. There have been several suspects in this case over the years, the first of which is a young man who confessed to the murder of a teenage girl in the mid-1980s. 16-year-old Heidi Martin left her home to go for a jog in Heartland, Vermont on May 20th, 1984, but did not return home. Her body was found the following day in a swampy area behind Heartland Elementary School, and it was discovered that she had been sexually assaulted before being stabbed to death. A 21-year-old named Delbert Tolman confessed to the crime and was tried for it. However, Tolman then recanted his confession and was acquitted. Oddly, the place where Barbara Agnew's body was found in 1987 was just one mile from where Heidi Martin's body had been dumped. 
Tallman had spent time over the years residing in Bellow Falls, Springfield and Windsor, Vermont, as well as Claremont in New Hampshire. About a decade later, in 1996, he was convicted on two counts of lewd and lavicious conduct with a child, and imprisoned at Lake County Prison in Florida for failure to comply with the sex offender's registration requirements. He was later released in October of 2010. The fact that he is still suspected of being involved with the murder of Heidi Martin is what gave way to the theory that he may be the Connecticut River Valley murderer. However, at this time, there is no publicly available evidence which shows that Tolman was the perpetrator or was involved with any of those murders. Another suspect in the case was a man named Gary Westover, a 46-year-old paraplegic from Grafton, New Hampshire, who told his uncle, a retired Grafton County Sheriff's deputy, that he had a confession to make. Westover told his uncle, Howard Minnan, that in 1987, his friends picked him up for what he thought was a night of partying. They loaded his wheelchair into the van, and the foursome headed off to Vermont. Here, Westover claimed that they abducted and murdered Barbara Agnew, the final victim of the Connecticut River Valley killer, before dumping her body. Westover wrote down the names of his friends, and Minnan passed the information to the authorities, but felt that investigators were uninterested in the story. Westover died in March of 1998, while Minnan died in 2006, although he told his wife and daughter about his nephew's confession before his death. In August of 2006, one of Westover's aunts wrote a letter to Anne Agnew, Barbara's sister, with the information given by the 46-year-old before he died. Anne forwarded this letter to a private investigator named Lynn Marie Carty, who suspected that Westover had met a man named Michael Nicolau at a Vermont hospital, and that Nicolau was possibly the Connecticut River Valley killer. It has never been confirmed, however, that the two did meet. Carty had originally been hired to investigate the disappearance of Nicolau's first wife, Michelle, who disappeared from Massachusetts in December of 1988, and whose family suspected that Nicolau had killed her. Over time, Carty began to feel that there was more to the ex-soldier than what appeared on the surface. Nicolau reportedly had an unstable childhood and grew up in several rough neighborhoods. After serving as a helicopter pilot in the Vietnam War, he was returned to the US with severe post-traumatic stress disorder and was treated at hospital for it. In the 1980s, he opened a pornography shop, but was soon charged with selling indecent material, and two weeks later, his store was robbed. It wasn't long before the business collapsed. In 1988, he was working as a drywaller. His friends and associates claimed that he made his living by working odd jobs and selling cocaine on the side. Some of them also noted that they felt Nicolau had a thirst for blood, and stated that he had killed up to 30 civilians during the war. Additionally, he was known to have lived in the Connecticut River Valley area during all but three of the attacks, during which he was living in Virginia. Eventually, Nicolau stalked his second wife to Florida, where he killed her and her daughter before turning the gun on himself. He reportedly spared his stepson. According to news reports, investigators requested that Nicolau's DNA be compared to evidence found at the crime scenes of the serial killer, but there are few reports about what happened afterwards, with one mention that the results were inconclusive. Many online sleuths do not believe that Nicolau was responsible for the crimes, likening him more to a ticking time bomb rather than someone who meticulously planned crimes and stalked victims. Additionally, many feel that the private investigator Carty is simply trying to insert herself into the case for fame or to boost business. Others have proposed the idea that multiple killers were at work in this case. For example, Linda Moore's murder does not seem to fit with the other crimes, and Jane Borowski might well have been attacked by a man who had mistaken her for somebody else. However, at this time, the cases are still all thought by law enforcement to be linked. If you have any information about the Connecticut River Valley Killer and their victims, you can contact the New Hampshire State Police Major Crime Unit's Cold Case Unit on 603-271-2663. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon, 
for as little as $2 each month. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.